Oh man, this took a long time to make. Hello, hello. Simplex is the name. Eurospy is the game. It's uh, been a little while since I've done a Eurospy TV episode. Um, perhaps about two years or so, but nonetheless, I'm here to give you a ride, an emotional journey. We're going to be exploring a show that I feel has been well and truly scrubbed from history. Does it deserve its 0% on Rotten Tomatoes? Well, put on your sunglasses, switch on your slow motion camera, and let's take a trip back to 2000 and the world of Secret Agent Man. To begin with, I'm not talking about the show that was originally called Danger Man, which starred Patrick McGowan and then was relabeled Secret Agent Man for its American distribution. No, this Secret Agent Man was a series that lasted only 12 episodes, and which you can barely find even a reference to it online. What the intended episode order is, is anyone's guess. As the one used by the DVD release, Rotten Tomatoes page, and the Wikipedia page does not really seem to parody the story of the episodes. I mean, for instance, the supposed 11th episode introduces us to a character who's been a staple since episode 2, so really I don't know what's going on there, but anyway. What actually is Secret Agent Man? Well, Secret Agent Man is kind of like Men in Black meets James Bond with a sprinkling of the Matrix and Get Smart. It revolves around a team of agents. They're, they're working for an unnamed organisation who are mostly separated from the government, except for those few times Brubeck, the, the head of the organisation, talks to the pre US president, which seems a bit oddly out of place for their general neutrality on, on political matters, but anyway. As you can probably tell from the name Brubeck, the series uses a different type of codenaming convention, giving agents the last names of jazz musicians. For instance, our main character, THE Secret Agent Man, is Monk, of course named after Thelonious Monk. His usual partner on missions is Holiday from Billy Holiday, and they're aided by Davis, the Q of the organisation, and his name of course being short for Miles Davis. It's pretty unique, honestly, and it's one of the points I most like from this show. It keeps, keeps it very fresh. The series has no overarching storylines, though there are two sort of recurring villains who crop up a couple times. We've got Prima, an ex-member of the organisation who's now decided to, you know, go off and set up her own evil organisation and just, you know, generally hangs out and does bad things and also is in love with Monk. Uh, in addition to her, we also have Vargas, who is the head of another evil organisation known as Trinity. It seems like there was probably a plan that these two organisations would perhaps either team up or, like, combine into one super organisation or something like that in future, but... Since the series was either cancelled mid-season or between seasons, there seems to be no evidence online as to which one it is, we'll never get to know what the original plan really was. There are other recurring elements too. Like Bond, actually especially early Bond, Monk is always found with a beautiful woman before being dragged away to save the world once again. And somewhat like Q, Davis always has a gadget for every situation, even though it may look a little daggy or wonky or just have poor effects, but... You know, it's pretty good still. Monk was played by an Australian actor, uh, Costas Mandalore, and is a highlight of the series. Suave, sophisticated, well-built, convincing in action. He generally seems to be enjoying himself quite well playing the character throughout, and it's a pity that he's never really had an opportunity to play a role like this since this show. He drives a very nice silver Avanti 2, which I have to say was very well picked as a sort of, I guess, rival to the DB5. It's got that same kind of sleek, cool feel about it, but it took me forever to figure out what car it actually was, because I'm, I'm not very familiar with car types. Dinah Meyer portrays Holiday, and, you know, she's pretty good. Her character is a sleek secret agent with a mild annoyance for Monk because of his continually being distracted by women instead of getting on with the job at hand. In most episodes, this is okay, but... It does kind of vary depending on the writer, from what I can tell, as certain episodes unfortunately just dial up this personality trait like way too high, and it just becomes practically unbearable to watch the episode because of how annoying she's been. Thankfully, there are only two or three episodes like this. She's overall pretty good, but she does, of course, ultimately play second fiddle to Monk, who very much is the star of the show. Davis, played by Dondre Whitfield, is a great character. Geeky, but not in a cringy or tiring way, which is nice. He's just quietly self-assured, which is something I, I really like. He's unlike any incarnation of Q, which does make him very unique. 
Sometimes he's just as much in the thick of it as the other agents, and he always has some gadget to get them out of their predicament. Thankfully, it's not usually too plot convenient, as Monk generally seems to handle himself with or without Davis's help. Davis is just overall quite likeable, and he even spouts exposition in ways that are not too boring either, which is pretty good plus. Brubeck, Paul Guilfoyle, too, is a real highlight. He could have easily, you know, become the, the classic M duplicate desk bound order giver, but instead he's actually quite dynamic and interesting. He uses the English language superbly, and some of the best scenes in the whole series happen in his office. His character seems to like the agents, but you know, he keeps that kind of cool detachedness. There's a bit of a running trope throughout the show that he doesn't trust them, and there are numerous times that we find out about, you know, things such as trackers or surveillance that have been conducted on the agents against their will. It's a nice touch to add a bit of extra moral greyness to a character who could have otherwise been rather flat. Prima and Vargas are not that great, in my mind. They're, I feel like they're both generally quite overacted and just generally I feel like let the show down a bit. It's probably more of a directing thing rather than an acting thing as they both seem to have the same same issue, but, but still, it is rather annoying. They ham up their performances so that they, instead of perhaps just being, you know, campy villains, become just sort of over-the-top, rather cringy antagonists, which is not particularly nice to watch. Also, Bernard Cuffling shows up once in a once-off role as the organization's butler. I'm not 100% sure if that's his title, but his weirdly out-of-place character just kind of works. I love it. The show is already rather bizarre in tone and just general choices, so his appearance kind of just fits more than it has any right to, really. So that's great and all. That's a nice sort of breakdown for you of the show, but where did the thing actually come from? I mean, who created this and why? Well, the series was created by Richard Regan, Barry Sonnenfield, and Barry Josephson. The most prolific and probably the most readily recognised of these three is Barry Sonnenfield, director of the two 90s Adams Family films, the Men in Black trilogy, and, of course, everyone's favourite film, 1999's Wild Wild West. Secret Agent Man was made during a time when Sonnenfield was partnered with Barry Josephson and Touchstone Pictures as Sonnenfield Josephson Worldwide Entertainment after they'd already had, you know, some kind of connection after both working on the first Men in Black film. Honestly, I just, I can't find any information on Richard Regan online, I, besides his work on Secret Agent Man, so I'll just assume he was probably associated with the other two on a previous occasion, probably on Men in Black, if you kind of follow that pattern that seems to be formed. Generally, from what I can extrapolate from broadcast dates and such, it seems like the TV show was probably filmed in 1998 or slightly less likely in early 1999, which kind of positions the show being created off the back of the wave of popularity that the first Men in Black film brought with it upon its release in 1997. And this makes sense with its aesthetic. I mean, the show feels like it could very easily exist within the same universe and maybe even Men in Black is some kind of subsidiary of Monk's unnamed organisation. But nonetheless, the show was supposed to release somewhere around September of 99, but this did have to be pushed back to August 2000 so as to give it more time to work on props and special effects. In addition to this, the show was thought to be so perfect by the studio that it was actually greenlit after only a presentation reel was shown rather than a pilot or anything. It was it's quite, quite impressive. Unfortunately, however, that goodwill didn't really last as only 12 episodes were made before the show was cancelled due to poor ratings. Perhaps if the show was made weekly, then perhaps there were more episodes planned for this season, but it seems like they were more so just kind of made in blocks before being released, which is also very confusing. Like, why, why were there only 12 episodes? Why is the story so abrupt? I'm just generally quite confused with how the, <laughs> how the show's like continuity works. But nonetheless, the effect was the same. The show ended and only 12 episodes survived today. Since its release, there also seems to be a lot of confusion by viewers over the show's origin story. And you might ask, well, why? Well, well as mentioned earlier, uh, either on purpose or accidentally, the show's name is identical to the US version of Danger Man. And it also has, you know, the same opening theme that the American show had, Secret Agent Man. However, the 90s Secret Agent Man has it being performed by the band Supreme Beings of Leisure instead of the original by Johnny Rivers. It's 
pretty obvious that these elements were probably picked for the 90s show for the sake of kind of trying to indirectly relate it to the 60s show. I mean, it, they're very jarring, to be perfectly honest. Like, they don't make that much sense. For instance, the 90s show is a team of agents, and even the lyrics in the song don't relate to the show, since the agents use jazz names as code names rather than numbers. Anyway, all this has and still does create quite a bit of confusion, thinking that the show is some kind of spin-off or, or remake of the original show, despite there being no on-screen or off-screen connections ever being established. And to be honest, that's about as much as I can find. As I mentioned at the outset, this has been as much as I can possibly scrape from the internet about the production. All that really seems to exist are the IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes pages, which are full to the brim with, like, really unnecessarily seeding reviews. It's not, the show's not that horrific. And also there is a singular surviving Variety article announcing the show's launch after the delays and very, very short Wikipedia page. Going back to my point earlier about how the theme song is quite mismatched with the content of the show, the titles are also quite mismatched. The, they're, they're very good, the, I do quite like the aesthetic of the title designs, but they're just, they're just not very representative of this show. The same with the scene transitions. They're very well done, they're very cool, I could totally love them if they were in another show. Just not this show. Overall, the general music is quite fitting, uh, written by David Bergeau, who had been writing since about 1987, but actually seems to have potentially retired now, which is quite nice, I hope he's enjoying that. Uh, the music itself is just generally a lot of sort of 90s industrial type stuff, which is quite fine. Some of the tracks are actually pretty catchy, to be honest, but it's just that main theme that's so oddly jarring. Speaking of things out of place, the show's action is very well choreographed, but is completely ruined with awful slow motion. Not only does this just like really kill the pacing, like making what should be fast and intense fights slow, drawn out, painful to watch, but it just generally doesn't fit. It probably was The Matrix that inspired this when they were in the editing room, but, un but unlike The Matrix, where everything was very carefully choreographed for the slow motion and it served the plot, just generally looking quite incredible, I have to say. In Secret Agent Man, it just kind of comes off as cheap and disinteresting, <laughs> which is not great. It's it's a real shame, as the action seems to be very competent. It's just obscured by some terrible effects work. Aesthetically, the show is definitely unique. I mean, the closest I can sort of relate it to is definitely Men in Black, with just how much silver and sort of black there is. But even then, there, there does seem to be sort of its own unique spin on it. I mean, overall, the best way to categorize it would, I'd say, probably just be 90s. <laughs> uh, I, I like it mostly. The only real letdown are just usually the bad guy sets, which just always end up being abandoned warehouses of some kind. I mean, I feel like I'm in something 60s Batman adjacent with just how many abandoned buildings are being inhabited by the secret agent man rogues gallery. Like, it's crazy. The set design is not even perfect for the good guys too, sadly, as... Sometimes the equipment or effects just come off as very flimsy. Possibly this is added to by the rather poor quality feeling film equipment that seems to have been used in production, but honestly, I just I can't quite put my finger on it. Things just often feel like just a bit off, just a bit cheap. I don't quite know why. But since we're on the topic of aesthetics, let's talk about something other that's also rather bizarre in this show. It's premiere product placement. FedEx. What I hear you ask? Why is FedEx a regular sponsor of a spy show? Honestly, the in-world reason for FedEx's direct placement is actually pretty permissible. It's, I would say, probably one of the better product placements I've seen. FedEx serves the unnamed organization of this world by having a number of their aircraft fitted out as secret spy planes and having their warehouses and trucks be access points and entrances to the base of this organization. It's honestly pretty good, and I actually do kind of like how no character ever mentions the brand name FedEx. It just makes it feel very natural to the world, which is so great. The only thing that makes it stand out is the fact that you just generally don't get an unsponsored product to take up such a prominent and consistent role in a show. If I had never seen any TV shows prior to this show, I probably would have thought nothing of it. I mean, that's just how well integrated this product is into the world. It's great. The dialogue for the show is 
pretty good for the most part. It's quite sufficient and can even be quite witty at points. Brubeck, for instance, is very eloquent. I, I love some of the, uh, the lines he gets, but it does sometimes, and especially with Holiday, the writing just has this tendency to lean towards the cringy, which is infrequent, but when it does happen, just kind of gets annoying. Technical dialogue is also quite poor. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm quite familiar with computers, but some of the lines make just so little sense. I feel like any viewer would be able to identify their inaccuracy. Nonetheless, this is fairly infrequent, so, you know, it's not too bad considering the dialogue on a whole is quite solid. The character interplay is also quite well represented with it. I, I love how some of the characters bounce off each other at times. The scripts for the show are overall fairly competent. Nothing's particularly incredible. They're, for the most part, the classic spy stories with the occasional oddities, generally, in the villain department. There are a few pretty memorable henchmen and villains in the show who definitely make up for some of the more lackluster scripts. For instance, these two roller skating German twins from the second episode are pretty cool, or a very good role by John Delancey as the leader of a secret cult worshipping an asteroid. But yeah, that's kind of all I have to say about Secret Agent Man, a show that definitely seems to have just been lost to the wastes of time. I'm, I'm very curious as to whether anyone saw this on broadcast, let me know if you did. Honestly, I'd say that the show is somewhat worth the watch. However, you've got to go in with the right expectations. Do not expect something on the level of the legendary shows like The Avengers or Department S or something. This show is very much its own thing and it's more than happy to do it. The only real thought you can kind of take in is that it's probably Men in Black adjacent. So if you are interested in watching the show, here are some of my suggestions for the best episodes. In no particular order, we have The Face. So this is the one with John Delancey just doing John Delancey. I mean, what else can I say? He leads a cult. He himself is just good enough to watch this for. You can tell he's having a lot of fun at the role. Monk, Monk 2 is pretty good in this episode. And the episode also kind of edges on the sci-fi, which is interesting. Like Father, Like Monk. Much like the title suggests, Monk's dad, who also happens to be a secret agent, teams up with him and they solve a case together. Monk's dad is uh, played by Winston Reckitt, who seems to be really relishing the opportunity to play a kind of Steed-style gentleman spy type character, which is cool. Super naked. Monk goes up against a really, really good enemy spy who just generally seems to completely baffle him. There are some really great scenes of him escaping here and dealing with like really odd situations, which is pretty cool. The Elders. Sort of recommended. Mainly if you want to find out some really well thought out lore on this universe. The episode covers some really interesting things about stuff that's supposedly going on behind this world's government and how it links to Monk's organisation. It has some not so great moments, but it does provide some pretty cool exposition. So if you actually if you're curious about like how the world of Secret Agent Man works, this episode definitely covers that. You'll notice I didn't list any episode numbers there, and as I mentioned before, all listings for these episodes tend to give different numbers and orders. <laughs> But even then, it's even more confusing as the two episodes which are consistently listed as the final two episodes are ones that introduce us to core characters of the show. It's very strange. Nonetheless, I, I hope I did the show justice, shining a light on a failed project which generally seemed to have everything going for it at the outset. Check it out if you like, but be warned. To watch this show, you kind of need to get physical media, which is what I had to do. I had to go find, find a seller on eBay to purchase it and hope that the DVD worked. But yeah, hopefully you can find a copy if you're looking for it. Anyway, that's all the time I have left for this episode, so I'll catch you in the next episode of Euros by TV. Hopefully it's not two years. Goodbye.